Well, good evening. I am exploring polar and parametric equations <laughs> with my good friends, Tom Dick and Steve Kokoska. Welcome to Monday Night Calculus. My name is Curtis Brown, and we are uh, live from Dallas, or at least I am, live from <laughs> Dallas area, Texas. I know we've got Tom out there in Oregon and Steve out in I guess you're still in Florida this time of year, aren't you? Yes, sir. Uh, really excited to have these guys uh, on here tonight doing a little bit of mathematics uh, and calculus for us. Um, tonight, uh, if you are watching live, please post something in the chat, ask questions, make sure uh, that we hear from you. I know that uh, the uh, student documents are up there in the um, description. So if you need to follow along, if you want to follow along or have your students follow along, uh, it's a great idea to have uh, them take that and uh, and use that. It's The link is down there in the description. You can download those and I will make sure the teacher documents are there uh, tomorrow. So uh, with now further ado, Tom, I think it's up to you. Oh, okay. All right. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. And let's see. Okay. So I think I've brought up a, a TI-84. And as mm -hmm. first mentioned, we're, uh, Steve and I will be talking about uh, parametric and uh, polar motion in the plane. And so we thought we'd just kick off. I'm going to actually take uh, the first example that Steve's going to take a look, uh, closer look at, at, at analytically. And uh, just use that as a way to remind people how to uh, do parametric curves on the, the TI 84. So, kind of first thing off is um, we go to the mode. Uh, you know, probably 90% of our time spent in function mode. Uh, but this is a place where we'll definitely want to change that to parametric. So on that uh, fifth line down, you can see I've got parametric flashing. I'll hit enter. And this uh, puts us really kind of in a, a new environment on the 84. Uh, my XT, theta, N key, let me press that key. Uh, you can see that that actually brings up the T now. Uh, that's because we're in parametric mode and that's going to be our independent variable. If I go to the Y equals menu, instead of my Y1, Y2, and so forth, I now have pairs of functions, X1T, Y1T, that's one parametric pair, and so on, X2T, Y2T. And so these are going to be functions of T that will uh, specify both the X and Y coordinates of the position of a particle as it's moving around in a two-dimensional space or the plane. Uh, so let's go ahead and enter something here and take a look at it. Uh, I'm going to use the example. Steve's going to take a closer look at here a little bit. And it's, uh, I think our X coordinate function is going to be two times. Uh, we're going to get an exponential in here. Mm -hmm. So E to the negative uh, T over 20. Now, if I just press that XT, I could hunt for T on the keyboard, but my XT theta key is now dedicated to the letter T. So that makes it convenient. So there's my exponent. So it's E to the negative T over 20. Now let me get it down out of that exponent. And we're going to multiply by cosine of T. And that's my X coordinate function. And then my Y coordinate function is actually quite a bit simpler. It's just yes. a, a linear. It's T divided by 2. And then we're going to subtract two. So that's the, my pair of functions that will plot a single parametric curve. So as the values of t change, both the x and y coordinates will change, and we'll we'll see uh, what curve is, is traced out here. Now, when I go to the window, we'll see some other changes here too. Down a little further, we see x min, x max, x scale, the usual things we see on our y equals window. Uh, but now we have a T min, T max, these are going to be the interval values of T that we'll be looking at. I think these are probably the, the default. So the T min is zero, T max looks like a weird decimal number, but a closer look looks suspiciously like an approximation for two pi. That kind of weird T step, I think that's probably pi divided by 24. A lot of the parametrics may involve a trig function, so that that's why you might have something like this. 
Um, I think uh, what I'm going to do is I'll just show you how we could change is I'll change my T max to uh, 10. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to change my T step to um, just 0 0.1. Okay, so that's going to plot actually 100 points. I'm, we're basically 0 0.1 from 0 to 10. Uh, and so that would be the increment and that T step will that also be the step on my tracing. So let's go ahead and graph this. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start out with a zoom decimal window just for grins. We'll see if that's a good window or not. Boom. And there's our graph. Turned out it was a, a fairly decent window. Uh, mm -hmm. We could, I suppose, zoom in a little bit. Um, but I'm wondering... Well, if you were paying really close attention, you might be able to figure out where the starting point for this curve was. And when I mean starting point, that was when T was zero and where the ending point was. If you weren't paying attention, it might not be clear where this thing started. So if we turn on the trace, notice we actually have three values down here, the T value, and then the corresponding values for both X and Y. And the, at the top, we can see at least part of the formula <laughs> for those functions. The Y1's complete, but we had to have the dot, dot, dot. And now when I trace, if I use the right arrow key, this, this may be a little incongruous. When I hit the right arrow key, that's going to advance T, but notice that my particle is actually moving to the left as I advance T. And the T values are incrementing at 0.1. So, this is a really, to, to me, this just completely changed the game. Uh, when graphing calculators came out, to be able to do parametrics this way, uh, I mean, to plot them by hand is, you know, unless you have very simple functions, that it's complete, very tedious. Uh, but we can, you know, get a picture of the curve and then ask the interesting questions regarding what's going on with the motion of this. And we actually have a picture of its motion. All right. So that was just kind of a brief, uh, uh, we, we can refer to X1 of T, Y1 of T uh, in the calculator screen. I'll just show that very quickly here. So let me just mm -hmm. quit. And if I uh, pull up bars and do parametric, And let's say I wanted to evaluate what's the X coordinate of this particle when T is equal to say 12, which was outside of the range that I was graphing. Boom, there it is. Okay, so it's calculated that. And so I can refer to, the, to those named functions as a shorthand, okay? So uh, we can, and we can do calculus with derivatives, integrals, the, the whole bit. So. Uh, that was just kind of brief refresher or reminder about how you can do parametrics on 84. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Steve. So okay. we can delve into this same example in a little more detail. Okay. Uh, so Excellent. let me stop the share and we'll give it back to Steve. All right. Let's see if this works. Hey, how about that? Um, Curtis, I wanted to apologize. Uh, I actually posted these problems three separate times on the Facebook page. The first time correctly. Uh, but the second time that I posted them early this morning as a repost, uh, between the first and the second time, there was actually an upgrade to uh, LaTeX. And when you upgrade LaTeX, I forgot to upgrade my font files. So some of the math fonts didn't appear correctly, but somebody caught it and I put the correct problems again. So they've been there. They're there twice anyway. And I <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I sincerely hope, Curtis, that you've done your homework tonight because, boy, there are a lot of questions for you. Okay. Oh, man. Oh, man. I just You're... came off spring break, Steve. <laughs> I don't know how many uh, calculus problems I was working on spring break. Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, all right. As Tom said, we have this particle motion in the plane, and it's described by these two parametric equations, x of t and y of t. And the first thing I asked for was a sketch of the path of this particle to try to indicate the direction the particle is moving. Well, as you saw with Tom on the 84, as he traced along that curve, as T increased, you could see the direction that the particle was moving along the path. And so this curve over here, I created with Mathematica, and I realized that the particle was moving in this direction. And so I added a couple arrows to that graph. 
On uh, the left-hand side, uh, that's actually a graph that I produced using the TI Inspire. And for the graph on the left side, <clears throat> excuse me, I actually went a little bit uh, greater. I think Tom there, I went to T equal to 15, just so that I could see a little bit more of this curve and make an observation of two or two here in just a second. Now, as Tom mentioned, it was you might be able to tell where this particle starts when T is equal to zero. And one of the things that we talk about, think about with our students is, do your answers make sense? And so let's just check a couple of things here and see if this curve really does make sense in this context. Let's see. So what happens at T equals zero? Can we evaluate X of zero? Can we do that by hand? Well, that's just 2 e to the minus 0 over 20 times the cosine of 0. So that's 2 times e to the 0, which is 1, times the cosine of 0, which is 1. So the x coordinate is 2. And the y coordinate is pretty easy to determine. That's just 0 over 2 minus 2, which is minus 2. So it sure looks like this curve is starting out correctly. And it sure looks like this point starts at 2 minus 2. Now, does the motion of this particle make sense here in the x and the y direction? Let's think about that for just a second. Let's look at this expression for x and t. Well, I see that it has a cosine in it. So I would expect that the x coordinate would oscillate back and forth. But there's sort of this damping effect here with this e to the negative exponent, so that as t increases, that expression with e in it gets smaller and smaller. So it kind of damps the effect of the cosine. So you can imagine the x-coordinate going back and forth, but decreasing these oscillations as t increases. And if I've done everything correctly, you can kind of see that in the graph on the left-hand side produced with the calculator. As t increases, x is moving back and forth, but those vibrations, those back and forth motions are getting smaller. That's pretty cool. And what about the y-coordinate? Does that make sense? Well, as Tom mentioned, this is a little bit easier. That's just a linear function. And what happens as t increases? Well, y increases without bound. So y is just increasing without bound. And we can see the y coordinate moving up in the positive y direction. So, OK, after all of that, does it make sense? Yeah, I think so. I'm pretty confident that I graphed this correctly. Now, one thing that I didn't show on this page, but I will in a minute or two, is I did, of course, on a previous page, uh, define x of t and define y of t. I did that on a calculator page, and I'll show you that in just a second. Cool, that was a lot in just part A. Sorry about that, Curtis. Let's take a look at B. <clears throat> so in B, I asked you to find the velocity and the acceleration vector at time t equal pi. Now, uh, just as an aside, uh, one of the reasons that I picked uh, problem number one and two and wrote them this way is because I think these are very common sorts of questions that we see on the FRQs these days, um, especially in the BC portion. So I think if students can do these types of problems, they'll be in good shape in May. And boy, that's coming up quickly. So how do I do this? Well, I've got to find x prime of t. Now look in the real world. In the real world of the exam, this is probably a calculator active question. But I'm going to do as much symbolically as I can because, well, just because we can, and that's a good exercise. So let's see, I've got to find x prime of t. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to use the product rule here. Uh, the first function times the derivative of the second plus the derivative of the first times the second. And I did a little bit of simplification. Here it is. I won't go through all of this in gory detail. Evaluated that function at pi, simplified a little. There's the exact symbolic answer. That's the x component of the velocity vector. Hey, y of t is, y prime of t is easy. I'll just remind myself here. y of t was 1 half t minus 2. The derivative of that is constant is 1 half. So that's easy. 
So now we've got the velocity vector. Curtis, it might be a little difficult to see, but what I've done is my vectors here, I usually write in bold face, if you can see that. So this is a vector. I've used vector notation. Tom and I are frequently asked about this on the exam. Uh, does it matter what notation the students use? Well, in general, so long as we can understand that they are referring to a vector, we're good. Um, they can write each component separately, but they've got to be very careful with notation, okay? So there's the velocity vector. I want the acceleration vector, so that means I need to take a second derivative. Jeepers, how do I do that? Well, I guess I'm going to have to use the product rule twice here. And I did that. There's three dots in there. There's a lot of work going on there. And I think I ended up with this expression. Evaluated that expression at pi and did a little bit of simplifying. 399 over 200 e to the minus pi divided by 20. Hey, the second derivative of y is very easy. That's the derivative of a constant. So this is interesting. The acceleration vector has a second component, a y component of zero. Now, I didn't ask you to do this, but I wanted to uh, because Tom and I have a nice demonstration of this, and it's often interesting to think a little bit about what these vectors mean. Curtis, if you can see these, the velocity vector at this time t equal to pi is in green. The acceleration vector is in maroon. The velocity vector is sort of pointing in the direction that the particle is moving. Here is a way to think about this. So it's a, got a magnitude, and it points in the direction as if the, the path stayed, or as if the particle stayed on a straight line at that instant. The acceleration vector, well, I don't know, tough to interpret. The best I can do for you is that it represents the instantaneous rate of change of the velocity at that time, at that point. So it's some indication as to how the velocity is changing at that instant, what it's going to look like in the next instant. Tom, did you want to do a little bit with this? Think you're on mute, buddy? I think he's on mute. But Steve, it's kind of interesting. In this case, it looks like the acceleration vector is always going to be pointing uh, I guess, perpendicular to the y-axis, Interesting, um, isn't it? which was an interesting observation as I was just looking at this and thinking about it. It's just kind of a, it's kind of a cool thing, uh, noting that that uh, is always going to be pointing left or right here. Yep. Interesting, isn't it? Huh? And what that's suggesting is that the, since it's pointing completely horizontally, it has a zero y component. Correct. Right. Right. Which is no, telling no me that the y component of my velocity vector will never change. Correct. It will always be constant. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which was something Steve noted is always going to be a half, right? So, yep. yeah. I mean, it's also, it's sense making, right, of what you already yeah. know, but it's kind of cool to yeah. see it visually too. Tom, did you want to do something with? Uh, yeah, let me yeah kind of launch off of that uh, okay. that that same Ill idea that you just had, Steve. And I'm going to mm -hmm. share a different screen here. Okay. Um, so this is uh, uh, Steve and I had an occasion to to work together and uh, work on some files and one of the uh, for the TI Inspire. And one of the ones we uh, spent some time with not that long ago was had to do with parametric motion. Uh, and this is a file, I, I've actually got a parametric curve uh, defined here, but it's hidden. It's not, I, I mean, it's, it's defined, but it, I don't have it graphing. But mm -hmm. what I've done is actually calculate the velocity and the acceleration vector at each time, and I've put time on a slider. So without seeing the curve, we're starting out, it looks like at one, two, three. Okay, we're starting out at four comma zero. Okay. These two vectors are telling me how this particle, something about the particle's motion at time t equals zero. So we should be able to look at that and, and guess 
if I advance t, what will the next point, where will the next point be on this curve? Looking at that velocity and acceleration vector. Well, the, the velocity vector is pointing straight up, so I would expect the point to just move pretty much straight up. Mm -hmm. But the acceleration vector is telling me that the, well, the, the velocity vector's y component won't change very much, but its x component is going to start to decrease. Right. It's moving in a negative direction. So let me go ahead and advance time. And you can see it moved kind of straight up and is maybe kind of indetectable, but it moved just a little tad to the left. <laughs> so it's starting to bend around. And this acceleration vector is now telling me that the y component of the velocity vector is now going to start to decrease. And it will continue to the x coordinate of the velocity vector is going to continue to decrease too, because this is pointing down and to the left. So I advance some more. It's continuing to go up, but it's bending a little bit more to the left. So Oh, this acceleration vector is telling me now that the y component is decreasing very quickly. All right. Now you might say, well, I can't keep track of what's going on here because <laughs> I'm always at a new point. But, you know, we could do, uh, let's bring up the menu and go down to trace. And we're not going to do a trace of the function, but we're going to do a geometry trace. Oops, let me get back to trace here. And go down to geometry trace. And then I'm going to select this point. And now when I advance T, it's going to leave a trail behind of the locations that it's been at. And the velocity and the acceleration vector really do tell a story as to where that is. They do. Is. They really do. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. And by the way, the, 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 the curve actually is stored away. If we did want to see the curve, I just bring up my curve. And you can see here, and by the way, the you see a page 1.1 and 1.2 up here. Page 1.1 is just, is just a notes page filled with directions on how you can create this document. It's not a hard one to build. The X3, Y3, if you look at that, uh, what I'm doing is calculating the uh, acceleration. So that's how that acceleration vector is getting figured out. X2, Y2, it's first derivative. So that's the velocity vector. And then there's my original curve. So it was four cosine T for X1 of T and three times sine of two T. And if I do a check mark on that, now we see the actual curve. And I can still do the same thing by seeing the whole curve as I go. So it still will trace along and show me those those vectors as I move. But I find this, it's it's kind of instructive to really think through what, is, what does the velocity and acceleration vector tell me? So kind of cool. Tom, and, I think uh, that's, there was one other thing I think you and I talked about on this, on this uh, page. So when you use that geometry trace, correct me if I'm wrong, those points are placed there at equidistant times. Is that correct? Uh, yes, and that's because uh, my slider is is incrementing at a at a constant rate. So, uh, so that's a great point, Steve. So when you see two points that are further apart, then the point like up here at the top of this uh, first bump here, yes. the points are pretty close together. That's telling me that because those are equal time in increments, uh, that's telling me that the particle is moving slower more slowly. But there if there's large jumps in its position, it's telling me that it's it's moving faster, really. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And uh so yeah, yeah, I think it's a it's a really helpful file for making sense of what parametrics are are telling us. And and most importantly to bring the calculus into it and what those velocity acceleration vectors are. Uh, you know, there is something, uh, what force do you feel when you're moving? Well, it's going to be proportional to your acceleration vector. 
and that will be the direction of the force. F equal M A sounds like some physics stuff. <laughs> All right. So um, let me stop the share unless you guys want me sure. to read anything while I'm here. Right. Pretty cool. Okay. So back to you, Steve. Okay. Here we go. So just to uh, finish up part B, how about that? Uh, these are some of the calculator screens uh, to produce the answers uh, for part B, where we're looking for the velocity and the acceleration vector. Um, so as Tom knows, I really do enjoy using the TI Inspire. On this screen here or this page, I defined my X and Y of T. And over here on this page, I was able to take the derivative of X and evaluate that at t equal pi, the derivative of y with respect to t, and evaluate that at pi. There are my answers, which I got by hand. And similarly, and I did a little fancy stuff here. I figured, what the heck? I actually created a list, not a vector, but I created a list so that it would look like a vector, where I took the second derivative and evaluated at pi, second derivative and evaluated at pi, and right there is the acceleration OK vector. There are the two components. So I think that's pretty cool that you can do all that symbolically on the TI Inspire. I still find that absolutely amazing. And uh, let's try part C here. We were just talking a minute or two about speed. I asked you to find the speed of the particle at time t equal 5 pi over 2. I'm going to look at this symbolically and and then with the calculator also. Um, so one way that I approached this because I knew what was coming here is I actually defined a function for speed. So my speed function is this, the square root of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared. And there's the expression for x prime. There's the expression for y prime squared, one half squared, one fourth. And then I wanted to evaluate that expression at 5 pi over 2. So I plugged all of that in. I did a little bit of simplification. And in the end, it's not that bad. There it is symbolically and numerically, that's equivalent to a 1.44. And of course, I want to check that on my TI Inspire. And I did the same thing. I defined this speed function. And I evaluated it at 5 pi over 2. Now, this looks a little different. And you might uh, remember, we've talked about this in the past, that sometimes on multiple choice questions, um, you may get an answer, but you may have to manipulate that, use some algebraic skills to get your answer to look like one of the four that is given. So often the calculator gives us an answer that does not look like something I would produce sort of naturally by hand. So when I saw this, I wondered, well, is that really the same answer? And when I evaluate that at 5 pi over 2 with a decimal in there so that I can see the decimal approximation, there it is. So I feel pretty good about that one. So the speed of the particle at that time is 1.44. How do we find the distance traveled by the particle over this time interval 2 pi to 3 pi? Well, I think I have very little hope, Tom, of doing this one symbolically. This is a definite integral 2 pi to 3 pi. Uh, of the speed. So x prime of t squared, y prime of t squared. And I, when I plug that into my calculator, I think you can see that right here. I got a 3.240. This is a good problem, I think, to emphasize uh, how you would re report this when you're taking the exam. So let's suppose this was a real question. And it asked, find the distance traveled by the particle over this time interval. Now, all a student really has to write is that definite integral, 2 pi to 3 pi. And we always get asked this question, can you use x prime and y prime? And yes, you can in this case, because x and y were defined and given to you in the problem. They have been named. So if a function has a name, you can use that. And the disadvantage to trying to write out exactly what x prime is, what y prime is, you may found them correctly. But the disadvantage is that there's more of a chance of making an error. It's just a quick typo. So use the named function wherever possible and then plug that into your calculator and get an answer. So a question like this, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, is often worth two points. One point for the setup which would be this, 
and one point to the answer for plugging that into your calculator and reporting the correct answer. With the following caveat, Steve. Yes. Uh, so I agree with you. That's often worth two points, one for the setup, one for the answer. But yeah. the answer all by itself will return zero. Mm -hmm. because we've got to see that setup. We want to see where that number came from. That is and correct. you might think to yourself, well, where else would a number like <laughs> 3.24 come from if I didn't do it right? Nevertheless, we want to see what the calculus setup is for that answer. That's correct. <laughs> and then, Tom, I thought I'd add just a little bit more here. Here is a graph that I produced with Mathematica. And this is actually the point on the curve that corresponds to t equal 2 pi. And this is the point on the curve that corresponds to t equal 3 pi. And so this distance traveled is really the length of that arc, the length of that curve between those two points. And that's pretty cool. You might, might, just to make sure that this makes sense, compute those two values, take out your ruler, and measure the straight line distance, and just see if it's close to 3.24, see how close that is. Cool. Yeah, in All fact, right. Steve, I was just eyeballing it and noticing that it it's Oops. extending from about one and a half yeah. to negative one and a half in the x direction, but it's on a slant. Yep. So I would expect it to be a bit over three, being the yeah, high of that. that. And so that three point two four, that's very, very rough estimate, but yeah. it, it feels good. It feels like okay, that's <laughs> definitely in the ballpark. Yeah. Yep. Pretty cool. Tom, should I continue with two? Before yeah, please. Go ahead, Steve. Okay. okay. So this is another, another part of the motion problem. And again, we're given at least some part of a parametric, parametric equations here. This time we're given x of t explicitly, but this time we're given dy dt. And this is also a common type of question that we see on the exam. I think this is also a very common wording here. So we have x of t and dy dt, where y of t is not explicitly given. And often we have an initial condition. And at this, in this problem, I'm saying that, well, at time t equals 0, uh, the particle is at this point 3 minus 1. OK, so I've actually given you uh, the curve here in this figure. It starts out over here at t equals 0 at that point, 3 minus 1. It is indeed moving in this direction. That's what the curve looks like. Find the velocity vector at time t equal one. Find the acceleration vector at time t equal one. Well, okay. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of this in gory detail. I would certainly use my calculator for this one. I could leave it symbolically if I wanted, but I'm probably gonna put x of t into my calculator. And I'll show you how I do, uh, how I will figure out uh, y of t in a minute. But x prime of t here is just minus 3 sine t. I plug in a 1. There it is numerically. And we're given dy dt, so I just evaluate that, e to the sine of 1. I think that's a 2.32 numerically. There's my velocity vector. <laughs> pretty cool, pretty quick. I don't know why brackets appeared here. I'll, I'll make those parentheses when I get this to you tomorrow, Curtis. Sorry about that. So x double prime of t, you got to take the derivative of this. Here we go, minus 3 cosine of t, x double prime at 1, minus 1.621. Uh, y double prime, okay, I've got to take the derivative of that expression that was given to me. That's not so bad. Uh, I take the derivative of the expression in the exponent, multiply it times e to the sine t, evaluate that at 1. There's the acceleration vector. So a lot of this I'm going to do using my calculator, and I did. Let me show you a little bit more here with part B. Find This is a little different. Find the time at which the speed of the particle is 3. Well, all right. I'm going to define once again a speed function. I know that that is x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared. I did a little simplification. Here it is. And I've got to set that equal to 3. How am I going to solve that on my calculator? There's no way I'm going to solve that symbolically. That's for sure. So how am I going to do that on my calculator? 
So on my weird way of doing things, here's x of t. That was given to me. And what was given to me actually was y prime of t. So that's the way I'm going to write it in. I can give any sort of name for a function that I want. And so I'll choose something that's descriptive to me, so I'll remember it. And I'm also able on the TI Inspire to actually define this speed function. There's the second derivative of x squared. And let's see, pardon me, the first derivative of x squared. And I've got y prime, and I just need to square it. So there's my speed function. Now, I can find or solve this expression numerically in a couple of ways. I'm going to do this in kind of, a, I think, a fancy way on a calculator page on the Inspire. I like to use the expression or the calculator, built-in calculator function called zeros. And Curtis knows, Tom knows, one of the reasons that I like to do this is because if if there are multiple answers, it puts those answers in a list, which I can then refer to so that I can pull specific values out of that list. And I really like that ability. So what I'm asking the calculator to do is to find the zeros of this expression, the speed of t minus 3. So it's as if I've set that expression equal to 0. And OK, I cheated a little bit. I, I looked at uh, the speed formula, and I looked for the first time that this occurred. Hey, hey Steve. Yeah. We've got a couple of comments and questions about uh, sure. why, uh, why the zeros command as opposed to using solve, since you have the cat, you know, you're using CAS and uh, a couple of questions around that. So again, the reason that I use zeros, Curtis, is because I think you can see from this answer that in general, zeros, if there is more than one answer, if there are multiple zeros, it will put them in a list. And so you can actually define a list equal to the zeros of an expression. And then you can refer to those individual values. So for example, suppose I was finding the zeros of a first derivative. I'm finding my critical points. And I put them all in a list. It's very easy now for me to refer to the exact stored value and evaluate a function at that exact stored value. Okay, so, that makes okay. sense. Yeah. So if, for example, I had called this list z, then I could refer to items in this list, like z of one, z sub one, z sub two. And I know that they're stored to the greatest degree of accuracy allowed by the calculator, and I can work with them this way. And if I wanted to, I could put that in another variable like a or b and do an integral that way. Right. So Steve, I, um, I don't know if this would disrupt the flow too much, but is there a way we could get maybe Tom to demonstrate what you're talking about out here um, with either this example or an, another one? We've got quite a few people asking questions around this. So sure. Tom, take a take a Tom, uh, I hate to put you on the spot here. Oh, no, that's uh, fine. So what? What take do you think a, will be most instructive here, Curtis? I think, I think just either modeling what Steve is talking about, utilizing that as a stored value, or if you've got another example maybe further on that has mm -hmm. multiple solution, multiple zeros, um, maybe take, taking that one. And if you need a second to set it up while Steve finishes here, that's fine. Okay. So think, about, think about maybe a fourth degree polynomial so that it has four roots okay. and just the zeros of it and throw it into a list A. That will explain it. Okay. 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 All right. So while you're setting that up, I'll see if I can finish this. Okay. Okay. So you'll also notice here, Curtis, this does not produce more than one value because I have that little such that bar, that little vertical bar there. So I'm right. asking or only the zeros that lie between t equals zero and two. And so there is only one here, and it's 0.811. So but if you had not restricted that, or if you'd given it a larger domain, yes. you could have seen that list of 
uh, zeros pop up pretty nicely. That is in fact true. That's absolutely true. Yep. Yep, and Tom will show you that, okay? Yep, that's true. Okay, so let's see if we can find the position of the particle at time t equal two. Well, let's see, x of t was given to us in the beginning of the problem. So that's actually the position of the particle at any time t, so I can just plug in two. So there's the x coordinate. Ah, how do you get the y coordinate here? Well, I think of this as a fundamental theorem of calculus problem. Many people think of this as a net change problem. Both are fine. I'm going to scribble a little bit if I can down here, Curtis. So I know that if I take the integral from 0 to t of y prime of x dx, that is y of t minus y of 0. I think of that as a fundamental theorem of calculus result. And so that if I want y of t, I can simply solve for that. And it is y of 0 plus this integral of y prime of x dx. It is the initial position plus the net change. And we see this frequently. Guarantee you this will be asked about on the exam in May. So y of t is the initial, y of 2, excuse me, is the initial position. The y coordinate was minus 1. Here's y prime. And when I plug that into my calculator, I get a 3.237. And in fact, just to sort of double check this one, Curtis, I graphed the curve parametrically and I traced along till I got the t equal 2 and the x and the y coordinates look pretty good. Minus 1.25, 3.24. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. Tom, I'll finish this one up and then I'll hand it over to you. Is that okay? Sounds good. Okay. Total distance traveled. Well, again, I don't think I'm going to be able to uh, do this one symbolically. There's a very small dt in there. It's kind of hard to see, but it is in there. I'm going to have to take the integral from 0 to pi of that expression, the square root of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared. I did a little bit of simplification in there, and I think that's 8.72. Again, a good example of the type of problem that you might see asked on the exam. And I think I had one more kind of interesting one here. Can you find the first time that the slope of the tangent line to the curve is 1? Well, you've got to think a little bit about this one. What's the slope look like? Well, the slope is y prime of t divided by x prime of t. So I found both of those expressions, and I have to solve this. When is that equal to 1? So I did the same sort of thing here. I define an expression m of t, and I used zeros there, and I found that first value was 3.402. On the right-hand side, I actually graphed m of t for t going from about zero, I think, to about 10. And you'll see that there, yeah, there are other values here where the slope of the tangent line would be one. But I asked for the first time that that occurs. And in fact, it is at time t equal 3.402. All right, Tom, what do you think? You got an example there? Excuse me. Yeah, I think so, Steve. So I can okay, get go ahead. All right. So um, just going to pull up uh, Inspire and um, just kind of illustrate this idea of what, what's going on with zeros. Uh, I'm going to graph a function here to start with. Um, and I'm going to take Steve's suggestion and take a look at a uh, quartic polynomial that have se several roots. So this will be x to the fourth. Oops, I <laughs> enter too soon there. So let me edit that. So minus 13 x squared, and let's say plus 36. Okay. Okay. So, and I made life easy on ourselves. This particular one actually fa factors pretty nicely. Um, and so it has some nice, nice zeros here. Uh, you know, we could pull up the analyze graph menu and get these intersections uh, one by one. 
Uh, but uh, what Steve was taking advantage of is a command that uh, it's it's like Saul, except it gathers your solutions pretty handily into a list. So right. let me show you how that works. I'm just going to go back to a calculator page. And in instead of doing a solve, I'm going to do uh, zeros. And I'll just type it out of that polynomial, which was in F1 with respect to X. I think that has to be just an S there, Tom. No E. Ah, that's why it doesn't recognize it. <laughs> I, so I did that on purpose just to make that <laughs> point there. So. Okay, thanks. So it's zeros. Ah, and you know yeah. how you can tell is the font changes yep. from italic to kind of straight non-italic, which means it recognizes that word. Okay. All right, let's see if this works out. And there, it's gathered them into a list. And so if uh, Steve was doing this and then name this list, he could load it into a spreadsheet, for example. I'm thinking if you did the zeros of a uh, derivative function, yep. and you're doing the candidates test, uh, you might have four or five zeros. And this would be a way of gathering them all. They're already in a list, and so you could then do a table and evaluate your original function at several places. So it's a it's an alternative to the solve. I think what it does is is it pulls the stuff out, puts it in a list where it's then uh, easier to use those results for your next step in the problem solving. Tom, before you leave this, sure. uh, I think I know the answer to this, but let's let's just try this one. Would you do one more zeros command for me? Sure. Do a zeros. And just for the heck of it, put in cosine of x. And then comma x. And let's see what it returns there. Now, yeah, this is a cast machine. So, so right. this might be different on the non-cast Inspire. So we want to make sure people are aware of that. But uh, this is, it's kind of funny uh, use there, but this is actually giving all the solutions. Yeah. To infinitely many and the idea that n1 that you see in bold is a placeholder for an arbitrary integer mm -hmm. so one two three four zero negative one two three four and also on so any integer could be put in place of n1 and then the resulting uh value there would be a zero of cosine so it looks like looks like odd multiples of pi over two is is that right pretty cool yep does that make sense ah oh, yeah the cosine is equal to zero when we're up at pi over two three pi over two five pi over two or if we backed off negative pi over two that is exactly uh, all the solutions yeah any other steve um i'm not gonna i, I don't want to do this but i i wonder um if you refer to that value, can you give N1 a value and will it return uh, a specific value? So if you said N1 is equal to five and then you, and that had a, that had a name like that were a list name of A, could you say A of one with N1 equal to five and would it give you the value? Well, here I've uh, set n1 equal to 5. Okay. And I'm just going to copy this down and see what happens. Oh, okay. Didn't do it. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think this n1, think, because it's in... Oh, go ahead, Curtis. I think that's a reserved... Yeah. Uh, a reserved... Character. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you can store it. I mean, you obviously you stored something to n1... But I think that N1 is a reserved uh, value. Very, yes. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, so it makes me one. Oh, in fact. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I <laughs> stuttered there a little bit. Um, one could, of course, replace N1 by a, a parameter of your own choice, Steve, and then do yes. that change. Yeah, gotcha. so, yep. So, 
Okay, I'm going to stop. I mean, even if in. you had typed it in as two times n1 min, uh, times pi divided by two, your own n1 would have been what would have pulled up there, and then it would have worked. It's just the fact that that n1 is reserved. Um, um, gotcha. Sorry, you don't want you don't want minus n one two times n one yeah, minus yeah. two one. times n one minus one mm -hmm. times. So why is that? Why is that bold now? It's bold because oh, it's I recognizing it, so it knows it's a defined value. So this should give me uh, five. Let's see, two times five is ten. Nine pi over n two. minus one is nine. Should give me nine pi over two. Let's see if it works. There we go, nine pi over two. So that does work. Yeah. How about that, okay. So then you could play with lots of different values. You could even make a sequence of values by using the sequence command and make a list of a hundred different zeros for your cosine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I'll stop the share on that. Okay. <clears throat> All right, Curtis, let's take a look at another one here. Um, Tom and I decided to add a couple of more problems here, uh, something about polar curves, because these problems have occurred recently on the exam. I don't remember seeing these any, many years ago, although I'm sure Mark Corrali would, but I, I don't remember seeing these many years ago. Uh, but we've seen, I think, a couple of problems recently where we're given a polar curve. Generally, of course, this is on the BC exam. And Part of the problem is a particle moving along this polar curve, and to answer the question, we often need to use a chain rule. Not all the time, but we often have to. So here's one. A particle moving along this curve C described by this polar equation for theta between 0 and 2 pi. Now, I didn't ask for this, but there's a graph of this polar equation, which is kind of cool. It's kind of a circle within a circle, but they're slanted a little bit. And I want to find the maximum distance of the particle from the origin. Now, I'm going to take a look at these two expressions, these two sentences for a minute. There are a couple of ways to attack this. What's the distance between any point in the origin? Well, it's really the absolute value of R. And how do you find that max? How do you maximize that absolute value? Well, one way to do this, maybe a common way to do this, is to maximize a new function, R squared. Because how do we deal with absolute values? You know, my general rule of thumb that I've talked about with you before, Curtis, is before you do any calculus, you've got to do something to get rid of that absolute value. So this is a way to sort of get rid of it. So to maximize that distance, it's equivalent to maximizing R squared. So we just think of R squared as a separate function and we work to maximize this function and we will eventually take our value of theta and plug it back into this original equation for R and evaluate the absolute value of R. Now, another way to approach this is to simply say, well, I'm going to work with just this expression R, which is theta squared times the sine of theta. Now, I'm not sure if I could come up with an example right off the top of my head. Tom might be able to, but I believe you can work with this expression so long as you evaluated all the critical values and you take into account the absolute value, you look at both the positive expressions for R and the negative expressions for R, and you look at the largest of those values. All right, so here's the way that I did it. I look at this expression for R squared, see if I can arrow up just a little bit. Took the derivative using the product rule. Here's this expression, yikes, it's a giant product. How do you make a product zero? Well, the only way is if one of the factors is zero. Well, there's zero. Sine of zero, sine of theta is zero here and here. And I solve this. Um, okay, sorry about this, guys. Using the zeros function once again. And this is kind of cool because, look, I saw this expression where there's my function f. I found the zeros of f prime between 0 and 2 pi, and there are my five values in a list. So there's a very good example of what Tom was showing you just a moment ago. I'm going to take those five values, and I've actually put them into this column right here in a list and spreadsheet page very accurately by referring 
to this list Z. And then I find the absolute value here. I find, pardon me, I found R evaluated at each of these expressions. Here, zero, zero, and zero. Here, R is 3.9. Here, is R is minus 24. We're looking for the greatest absolute value. Well, it's certainly going to be this expression right here. Now, where does that occur? I'm going to arrow up just a little bit here. Well, it seems to make sense that it's about, oh, I don't know, I'm just going to take a stab somewhere over there. That looks like it might be the farthest point from the origin. You might have a guess of where this point corresponds on that curve. And where those others do, of course, that gives you a little bit of an idea about how this particle might be moving along this curve. Now, just to confirm all of this, try to have this make some sense, I actually graphed the absolute value of R, and there it is. And I used the TI Inspire to find the maximum over an interval. And son of a gun, there's the 24.083. I feel good about this answer. I think I got the right one. Now, there's a second part to this. There's an awful lot here that's done analytically, but let's just think about how to do this one, theoretically anyway. So a particle is traveling along this curve so that its position at any time t is given by, okay, x of t, y of t. And we know that d theta dt is three halves. I want to find dx dt at this instant when theta is pi over three, and we want to interpret this answer. Well, I guess when I saw a problem like this, I immediately think about the chain rule, and I immediately see this and say, well, I'm going to need an expression for x for sure. So I know that, let's see, x is equal to r times the cosine of theta, so I plugged in R, and there's my expression for X. Now, thinking about what's given to me, thinking about what I need to find here, dx dt, can I write an expression for dx dt using the chain rule? Well, sure. That's dx d theta times d theta dt. And let's see, do I have expressions? Do I have values for any of these on the right-hand side? Well, d theta dt is pretty easy, but how do you get dx d theta? Holy Toledo, look at this one. Curtis, give me one answer tonight. How do I find, <laughs> how do I find dx d theta there? That looks awful. How do I do that? What's the general idea, the general concept in order to find the derivative of that expression with respect to theta. Any ideas? I hope you delayed that long enough that the chat can help me out on this one. Here. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the problem. Here's the problem. It's not just two functions of theta. It's actually three functions. I was going to say, you've got three functions there. So. so indeed, what you have to do is use the generalized product rule here, which says you take the derivative of each one of those functions separately multiply by the remaining two, and then add it all together. And so that's what I've done in this expression in the parentheses. There's d theta dt. There's a little bit of simplification. This problem asked me to, what's going on when theta is equal to pi over three. There's the exact symbolic answer, and there's the numerical approximation. How do you interpret this? Well, when theta is equal to three halves, the x-coordinate of the particle is increasing at a rate of 0.538. That's the way I interpret it. Cool. I think we're pretty much at the end here, Curtis. We do have a problem four, which we'll post, and we actually have four overtime problems here. Some good problems that were posted on the Facebook page. Uh, so we'll have solutions to, we'll have those questions and those solutions also posted. I'll send those to you tomorrow for sure. Pretty good. Any last minute questions, Curtis? No, no uh, last minute questions. Although Stephen Beck and Mark Crawley did come to my rescue there and uh, <laughs> suggested some some ideas. Uh, 
So really quickly tonight, I'll put I'll post my uh, email address here in the chat. Uh, but I wanted to let everybody know that we'll be back online here in about two weeks on April Fool's Day. We are oh, not no. joking. Uh, <laughs> April 1st is the next uh, session. Uh, but I've got a fool you already. I won't be here, uh, but I'll be replaced by Allison uh again and she'll be taking care of things running uh the things behind the the scenes while uh we watch these guys do great work uh i'll be on vacation again uh so yeah i mean <laughs> it's great but teachers if you guys uh are looking for uh professional development hours please uh email Email me. My email address is there in the chat, or it should be here shortly. Um, and I will uh, let you guys uh, get that link to the um, professional development hours. Also, just be mindful that um, the last Monday night session, uh, which I believe, I can't remember the date off the top of my head. It seems April like 22nd. April 15th. Or April 22nd. 22nd. Yep. April 22nd, we will be doing a test preparation session. I would highly advise you to mark that on your calendars for students and get them uh, to come and join us, get a few calculator tips and some great calculus test taking uh, tips from these guys as we uh, help prepare uh, for the AP exam coming up in May. So Mark that date, April 22nd. Uh, we'll have that ready uh, for you guys. All right. So we'll see you guys here in a couple of weeks. Email me for that uh, content and uh, take care.